So Dr. Alfred Sung came to Singapore in 1997 and studied at the Chinese high school under full scholarship from MOE. Uh, subsequently, Alfred was awarded the A Star and SS PhD scholarship and obtained his uh, Bachelor's of Science from Duke University and PhD from Stanford University. During graduate school, Alfred pioneered a novel transdifferentiation method to convert human dermal cells into functional neurons that ignited his interest in human cell-based modeling of neural development and degeneration. Currently, Alfred is focusing on functional studies of neuronal subtypes and also exploring 3D brain organoid models as a novel tool to study neurodevelopmental disorders as well as aging-linked neurodegeneration. So here you go, we have Dr. Alfred Sun. So please go ahead and do a round main check and we should be good to go. Thank you, Dr. Alfred. The floor is yours now. Thank you. Thank you, Callum, for the very kind introduction. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. So um, so the title of my talk today is actually um, Investigating Human Neurological Disorders with Human Neural Cells. As, as, um, as being introduced, um, um, we... Um, I'm primarily interested in understanding human neurological disease. And the, the reason is really notwithstanding um, the kind of knowledge and, and, and insight we learned from model organisms shown here, like those are commonly used laboratory uh, uh, organisms for studies. I just want to remind everybody that there's a vast difference between human system versus the, uh, all the animals we use in the lab, right? So that really comes from the next slide that summarizes three of the major distinctions among the human versus the other animal species. For example, our brains are really big and complex as shown here, as compared to the mouse or the rat brains, which is a lot smaller and less complicated. Also, so not only the size, but also the uh, structures and their unique features of the human brain that made us uh, unique. So I'm illustrating here uh, two, two of such differences. One is in the uh, development or sort of uh, developing, uh, developing, developing <clears throat> developed in brain, you have structures known as the OSVZ zones that's uniquely present in the primate and above. It's virtually absent in the mouse or uh, rat brains. And also in the case, this is a, a, a the session of the uh, um, midbrain part. Uh, that this is known as the substantia nigra region. Now this is, uh, uh, I will come back to this later in the second half of my talk, but here you can clearly see this is pigmented, right? These are dark regions. So this sort of pigmented uh, is due to uh, what we call neuromelanin. The presence of neuromelanin is also primate specific and it's age dependent. So, so, so it's, it's, it's in you and I and probably a lot darker in the elderly's brain, but it's not in the mice, even in the aged mice or, or rats. So those are the features that are uniquely present in the humans. Uh, some of the unique features that unique present in humans, but not in the uh, other species. And of course, one last reason is our brain is really inaccessible. So uh, it, it's it's really well protected from the scalp. So anything you want to do to it, it it's, it's pre pretty much impossible. Uh, so uh, uh, having said all this, it's really to pave way to suggest that we really need some kind of models, human neural models, to, to have that in a dish to study them and be able to model uh, certain uh, phenotypes or, or pathology in a dish. So let's let's take a sort of quick overview of the current status of the field when it comes to uh, human neural cells. How do we obtain those things? So the first arrow here in black is shown as the um, IPS cells. This is nicely shown by Shane and Yamanaka. So from now, from a somatic cell, we can be blood or skin cells. We can convert them into uh, ES cells or IPS cells. So uh, for our purposes, these cells, we put these cells as functionally equivalent. And that you can do so what we call classical differentiation using different patterning factors and other stuff to make them into new progenitor cells and then into a, a, a narrow round of maturation into neurons. Now this is fine, but uh, this is what scientists have been doing for the last 20 decades or 30 decades, and we learn a lot, okay? But there's a pro there are certain caveats with this system that is it takes longer time, and usually you get a mix uh, neuron types and variable efficiencies. So I was in grad school, um, so we thought about this way as a direct conversion. So starting from dermal fibroblasts, we put in genetic materials, transcription factors, or microRNAs, and then they can directly convert into neurons. So this is what we call a direct conversion or trans differentiation by many other people. 
it's cool, but uh, it cut down the time required a lot, but the, it has also a, its downside. For example, the yield is typically lower, which means you can't do a screen, and there's a limited subtypes and the cells are typically immature. So when, when I started my postdoc, uh, I decided to <laughs> study this diagram quite a bit and decided to come out another arrow that I want to draw into the, um, into the figure schematic here. So what about starting from yes cells? Can you directly take them to neurons? The advantage of starting from yes cells is that these cells are proliferating and you essentially have a line. So you don't have a problem with the initial cell number. You don't have a problem with sort of the, the line to line variation and the passage variation this way. So if you can figure out this, then it will also be quite a fast way to get functional neurons. So that's exactly what uh, what I did in focused on in my first part of my uh, postdoc. And that work has been essentially published in 2016. So essentially I come up with two genetic material sets that upon overexpression in reporting stem cells, ESLs, IPS cells, you will take them either to excitatory neurons or inhibitory neurons, the two principal neurons of our cortex. So we call that uh, IEN, stands for induced excitatory neuron, and IGN, induced for uh, indu uh, in induced inhibitory neurons. Okay. So just to give you a quick overview about how robust this system, this system is and how fast the turning of the neuron is, you can see that within days, this is probably within a week, you will see the cells really dispersed out from their compact ESL line morphology to, that, uh, to take down the shape of that of neuron. And by day 20, you have a really elaboration of the neurons and the cells are very much sure. So it is armed with this, uh, this sort of novel uh, direct conversion method, we realize that now we can really utilize such a pro uh, such uh, uh, protocols to 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 really get some functional human neuron and be able to study if there are any functional phenotypes. So that lends to the, that leads to the second story, a quick one I want to talk about that is Angelman syndrome, right? So Angelman syndrome is a very rare childhood neuro neurodevelopmental disorder. We choose that actually primarily because it's it's monogenetic. Uh, genetic. So it, we know the genetics very well. That is the uh, UBS3 deficiency. So you can see here, in the majority of the cases, you have a deletion in the maternal copy of this, uh, this UB issue because it's imprinted. You have a problem. And then in other cases, you have actually have mutations or, 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 or imprinting defects. All this suggests that um, if you cause some changes to essentially a uh, 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 loss of function mutations, a loss of function phenotype of UB3 will give rise to Angelman syndrome. Okay, now Andrew syndrome as uh, the syndrome has different a uh, spectrum of phenotypes, right? But the one that we really wanted to focus on is actually epilepsy series, uh, as shown here. Because why? Because actually this one is a leading cause of death for those patients. Um, when I was in the States, a clinician told me that a pediatrician told me that for Andrew cases, um, if the if the child was able to is able to survive into adulthood, they are relatively okay. Uh, they are a little bit impaired, they're intellectually impaired, but, but by and large, they lead a normal life, all right? However, many of them die at a young age, at the teenager st stage. And, and, and the reason is really pathetic, that is, uh, many of them die uh, m m in drowning. And why? It's because sometimes the, the spontaneous uh, uh, erratic seizure happen when they are swimming and they just, they just get drowned. So that's, that's really pitiful. And, and so we want to understand how seizure happens or why the Angelman syndrome patients uh, have such a high propensity towards seizures, okay? So here is the sort of the concept that study, and, and, and the study design. We want to understand how UBH3 loss of function will eventually lead to epilepsy in patients. And here is the study design. So we use CRISPR to knock it out, UB3 in the embryonic stem cells. We use H9, a well-known uh, use line in the, in, the, in the world. And also we have some uh, Angelman a patient derived IPS cell that were obtained commercially. We then make them into induced neurons and then study the functional deficits. And by doing that, we hope to gain some mechanistic understanding about the disease and how the seizure will be uh, uh, ensued. Okay, so um, here is the data. So because this story has been published, so allow me to go through this really quickly. So here you can see that we use CRISPR-Cas9 to knock it out and uh, we validated that by both use both uh, Western blotting shown here, this is Allure, and also to use immunostaining. So in the neurons, in the wild cat cells, you have very nice UBH3 staining, but it's, it's completely absent in, in the NACOG. So this is just validated that we have that uh, well. When we make neurons, uh, we realize actually the neurons we, we made, actually they, they, they just 
behave, uh, they just become neuron just as fine as the wild type cells. And actually, when we look at it, we cannot tell any differences in terms of morphology. When we look at the show analysis, the neurons and interactions, they are, they are normal. So, so <coughs> Sensitive density, excuse me, it's also normal as quantified here. This prompts us this sort of lack of apparent morphological phenotypes. It's kind of surprising and not surprising. So it is surprising to us that uh, this looks absolutely fine, and it's, it, 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 it is, and, and yet in the field that people, many people have reported all kind of phenotypes with this dendrite phenotype or whatever uh, in the mouse models. Uh, uh, there's a Bunch of other phenotypes, but we don't see that in the human neurons that we obtain. But it's probably not surprising to us because Angelman syndrome, by and large, during development, you have this this seizure ability. But their development is by and large normal. So this in, uh, this implies to us in this UBA three A uh, knockout that we probably don't expect to see a major sort of differentiation uh, 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 phenotype. Now, but this also then allowed us uh, sort of propelled us to look into the function of the neuron more carefully. Actually, now and then we see that actually at the higher current injections, these knockout neurons are actually able now firing a lot more. So the spike frequency is increased in the knockout neurons as compared to the wild type, which is quantified here. Uh, to be sure, this is not a line specific thing because I mentioned that the first clone was generated, the first knockout clone was generating H9. We just want to be sure that uh, we can uh, we can do that in other pair, right? So we choose H1, and this is what we call clone B. So in the both cases, fortunately, we are able to reproduce the phenotype. So what is the phenotype? This is actually called a fast AHP, which stands for after hyperpolarization. So we realize that actually in the knockout cells, it has an increased amplitude of the FAHP. And we show that in both the H9-derived clone, knockout clone, as well as in the H1-derived knockout clone. Okay. And if UB3 is really mediating this effect, then one would predict that the exogenous restore of the UB3 expression should rescue the phenotype, right? And that's what we did, and that's, this is exactly what we saw. So we see that lentiviral mediated overexpression of ub 3 a was able to restore the, um, uh, the spike frequency phenotype as back to normal, and also rescued the, decreased the, the FHP amplitude to, to the wild type level. All right. So I mentioned all this so far, the two clones are generated using the um, uh, human ES cells. What about in IPS cells, right? We had the IPS cell, we made it into neurons, but here the, the, it's quite the opposite, right? So the, the endurance cells, as expected, would not have UBE3A because they have a they have an imprinting prop. Now, if we put back UBE3A, it should express it, and that's what we see. We did express it, but the phenotype is expected. It is the opposite. You would expect this to behave like a wild type, this to behave like a knockout, and that's what we see here. Okay, so so far the data is quite nice that it's all very consistent. Um, but uh, we want to understand a little bit more about the network level because eventually it is a network hyperactivity, a seizure like activity. But what the phenotype I told you before, I told you so far, is only a cell intrinsic sort of deficit in terms of fire, right? So to do that, we turn into another assay known as a multi electro array, also known as NDA. So we essentially play neurons onto those gold plated electro and measure the activity, the electro activities of this ensemble of neurons, the hundreds and hundreds of these neurons. And we'll be able to uh, document their sort of burst firing like this. And indeed, upon quantification, we realize in the knockout that there is a higher synchrony or higher uh, frequency of burst-like firing in the, in, the, uh, in the neurons for the knockout. Okay, this is perhaps better visualized through a movie here. <clears throat> Okay, so you can see that the knockout cells seem to have this synchronized bursting a lot more often than the uh, wild type cells. All right, so this is what I showed you so far. So we showed you that I showed you that UB3 loss caused FHP increase, excited really also increased, and that, that leads to a network dysfunction. But what's needed in this, right? So that's where we um, uh, we look at what uh, we research literature essentially to look for what are the potential molecular players underlying this increased FHP. And, and there's not much players known, actually. So we, the, the most highly you know, likely player is actually the BK channel. And BK channel is well known because they are very good pharmacology, uh, uh, use pharmacological uh, agonists and antagonists for it. So we try that, and then we use essentially Paxilin, which is a well-known uh, validated BK blocker. So indeed, we, we show first that the BK current in the knockout cells are larger than in the wild-type cells. 
And uh, so to, to understand this better, why the BK current is actually higher in the knockout than the, than the, the bar type, we turn to quantitative Western blotting. And this is where we got a lot of help actually, but from the Azura C600 imaging system. So it's, it's shown here. So you will notice that in this triplicate pairs, that the only thing really consistently change is a BK. But you notice the level of changes is not that high. It's only about 20%. Uh, so so we, we can see this because BK never gets changed a lot. Uh, it's in, almost impossible to, to change the BK level a lot. So it's about 20% it's about change. But this 20% change is actually quite a meaningful. It's causing a phenotype. So um, <clears throat> I have to say that in this particular case, in this Western, the BK and a lot of, for example, the ATP, oh, I'm sorry, the ATPase alpha subunit will actually, actually image from the same membrane thanks to the NNR near infrared imaging system from the Aurora system allows me to be really sure that there's no stripping that's uh, uh, involved to be, to be very sure about the quantity, quantitative changes in the protein levels of those things. All right. So, uh, the, an alternative way to confirm that there is a BK increase is we turn to atomic force microscopy. This works slightly differently. Essentially, it's, it's a candivire, candilever that allows you to functionalize by putting a BK antibody to it. Now, if you scan this thing uh, across the neuron cultures, if there is a BK, right, so the BK will attract the antibody, will bind to it, and that is shown as a registered asteroid. It's, it's shown as a downward for dip and that's registered by this, this, this cantilever and it's shown here. So by doing that and plotting the distribution of the force, we can actually uh, have an idea about the BK density. So by doing that, that's what we, we show here. So it looks like the neuronal surface have a higher BK density in the knockout as compared to the wild type. So putting these two evidence, independent evidence together, we conclude that indeed uh, there seems to be a increase in functional BK surface from the knockout neuron as compared to the wild type. All right, so having shown that, then the next thing we want to show is actually the BK blocker now can normalize the function, right? It's a phenotype. Yes, indeed. So we show that when you apply the Paxilin at appropriate dose, you're able to rescue all this phenotype I talked to you about, the excitability, the FHP, as well as the network level. Its hyperactivity is restored to the normal level. Okay, so I'm just, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip all this Western to the uh, panel of Western data. Essentially, this panel of work is to show, to, to, to nail it down, to show that the UB3 actually functioning as the issue between ligase to degrade. So it's true the proteomimal degradation pathway of the BK. Okay, uh, again, all these images were done using the Arduino machine. Uh, so that I can get to the more meaningful stuff later. Okay, so I just showed you that we, we find that the substrate of a normal substrate of UB3 in this case is actually the BK channel. Now, this is a very normal finding. Nobody in the field of epilepsy or, or uh, 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 I would say Angelman syndrome ever suspected that, that this is a flare. So this is a normal finding and it's a normal substrate for UB3. And we also find that uh, uh, this can be used as uh, a way to intervene with uh, potentially to normalize the phenotype, right? But uh, there's one thing missing that I didn't get to show you. Oh, that is from, um, <clears throat> again, I, sorry, I jumped ahead of myself. But the data so far I showed you is all from the 2D cells, right? And it's not a normal differentiation protocol that I use. We use the direct conversion, which is fast and functional. But there was a question, there was a concern from us, from the reviewers, that how is this, if you do it in a normal developmental uh, sort of uh, uh, differentiation protocol, would this, would this phenotype still be there? So we thought about that, and the way to address that, uh, we, we decided to use the 3D organoid approach. So we make a, a normal cortical, uh, so cortical brain organoids from this, and you can see that at the day 30, both the wild type and knockout gave rise to very similar uh, organoids. And you, you session them, you realize, uh, and look for the um, protein markers for the cortical organoids, they are by and large normal as well. There's no disturbable distance, uh, differences between the wild type and knockout, and as far as we can tell. Okay. You grow them longer to a hundred days and above. Now this really grow to a millimeter scale organoid, and if you session them, you can see cortical layers. I have to admit that uh, based in our hands, this is a modification from the Pascal protocol that we use. The Pascal protocol we used, we can't really get this uh, very nice six layer cortical layer, uh, 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 layer by layer like that. But what we have is the rough segregation of the upper and the lower and and, and the deeper, uh, upper and the deep layers. Okay, as shown here. 
But again, between wild type and knockout, there's no major difference in terms of the layer marker distribution. That's my point. So again, we, we see that, uh, 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 that actually BK is increased in the knockout and all the phenotypes that we, I mentioned about that we discovered through the 2D neurons are actually can be recapitulated as also present in the 3D organized. Okay, but allow, having 3D organized actually is advantage, allowing us to look at the network uh, uh, analysis uh, uh, more carefully using calcium imaging. So this is what we did here. So using two photon calcium imaging, we're able to show that the what we call a synchronized synchrony index, which is the network level uh, uh, simultaneous firing of different neurons, is actually increased in the knockout as compared to the one type. Again, highlighting the hyper network activity of the organoids. Okay. So this is what I showed you so far, leading to one network activity. But really, the, the patient has epilepsy, right? How do we have epilepsy in a dish? That's a fundamental question that we cannot address using all the methods I told you about. To that, we can only go back to the animals. So we obtained an Andrew mouse model from University of North Carolina in the States, and then we shipped it over and performed the, we decided to try to see if first validated that the Andrew mouse, the knockout mice, are actually prone to epilepsy. And the second to show that indeed we patched that we realized, hey, in the hippocampal neurons in this case, that there is an increase in the BK current and the AHP is also increased. It's the excitability of the neurons also increased. This is again the normal finding. None of the animal mouse paper before I mentioned this phenotype. Okay, but the really the killer experiment is, the, is this one that we are uh, we have to show that now the BK blocker, hexlin or and other stuff. Is able, should be able to rescue the epilepsy phenotype. So we use two paradigms looking at epilepsy threshold using this RCO, as well as epilepsy grade using picotoxin. This is a GABA blocker. In both cases, we are able to see that the Paxilin is able to normalize the uh, epilepsy propensity of the, the, the mice. All right, so to quickly summarize, this is published end of last year. So we started actually, this is a fun, this is a, a really a kind of a functional modeling part of uh, Andrewman uh, 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 patient, uh, Andrewman uh, syndrome uh, neuron cells. We started from a, a very simple idea that is we want to make a functional 2D neurons and study whatever is wrong in this neuron. And surprisingly, this leads us to uncover our excitability phenotype of the knockout neurons. And we subsequently validated these findings in 3D human brain organoids. And we did a bit of biochemistry to find out how it works. And then we went on to the mice and be able to show that indeed that the epilepsy susceptibility is able to be rescued using the DK blocker. So that is sort of a, a, a quite a complete story. And uh, uh, I think that's probably one of the reasons why it gets, gets into science. Okay, so um, I just want to highlight a, a, a point from here that's different from most of the Andrew uh, uh, studies in the field that most people study the mice uh, neurons and mice models. We learn a lot from these uh, mice models, but uh, I also mentioned that the mice studies, none of these mice studies uncover this phenotype, right? So why, why is that so? And, and, and what's so special about our, our, our system? Well, I would think that there are at least two things. One, the, there could be a mice human difference in, in the sense that the, the mice phenotype is there, but the phenotype, the magnitude of the phenotype or the effect size of the phenotype is a bit smaller in the mice as compared to the human. For some reason, for, for humans, it's, this AHP change is really apparent. We are able to, to see that very uh, early on from the study. Okay, in the mice, it's not so apparent. So perhaps that escapes the investigator's attention. But really, what we are doing differently is we use this trans differentiation or direct conversion protocol that, that our neurons are really functional. Okay, that's that's very different from the traditional protocol where you have to culture the neuron for a long term. And still, many of the neurons do not fire, or some of the neurons fire a lot. Uh, you know, it's, it's electrically more active than the others. We, we don't have that. And so in this case, the uh, the the mat functional maturity of the neurons really helped us to uncover this novel phenomenon. That's what I believe. Okay, then uh, just to, the, the worst thing that can happen to a post at that time, we are about to really halfway through your work is your boss left. And so, so I had to shift it to my second post and, 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 and then the, uh, the, the inevitable thing is that I have to shift the project, right? And so the new PI that I worked with is actually a clinician focusing, focusing on Parkinson's. So he said, it's fine, you can, you can work under me, but you have to switch to uh, Parkinson's modeling. So that lens actually get me to uh, force me to to look into the organoid model a little bit more, and I uh, was able 
and I'm, I'm about to share the, the kind of, uh, to share some work coming from this study, because now actually, surprisingly, this is becoming the major part of my, my, my team's focus. So to, to understand Parkinson's, which is neurodegeneration phenotype, we first know that uh, the, there's a very particular notable feature of the pathology practice. It is a very special type of neurons, dopamine neurons, and it, this is only the dopamine neurons in the substantial nigra, which is a region within the midbrain that is dying. Okay, so the pathology is really clear. So we thought that time that in order to understand that, perhaps we can make a human midbrain organ system. That time we are we are really inspired by Lancaster's work about the whole brain organ. But we think that for the Parkinson's, you know, a midbrain specific uh, uh, organ may be more useful. So again, this is past work that has been published in Cell Stem Cell in 2016. So just to give you, uh, this is again, we learned from developmental biology to know how to pattern the ESLs into the midbrain region by sort of optimization uh, of the two axes, <coughs> the, <coughs> the dorsal ventral axis, as well as the uh, rostral caudal axis using morphogens, solid hedgehog, and then green pathway. Okay, this is to show how the organoid will grow. So essentially, they grow to more than two millimeter big over the course of 50 days. And we do a immunostaining to look at the organoids. We show that they are really authentic midbrain organoids. Behave uh, as, as far as we can tell, as compared to the mouse ventral midbrain uh, uh, sessions, you can see that they are marked by the cardinal midbrain of sort of floor play markers. These are FOX A2 and, and, and LOTF2. And later on, these cells turn on to turn on to, uh, later become differentiated neurons and turn on TH. And we have subtype of those TH neurons as well, marked by PERC2 and CAL binding. And these cells are functional through our electrical, uh, electrophysiological analysis. Okay. And we did a, a, a RNA seq analysis, look at uh, the global transcriptome of the cells, and compare to adult midbrain, adult fetal, adult forebrain, or adult other brain region. We realized that our and we call that midbrain like organoids. So our organoids actually lies closer to the perinatal uh, midbrain than any other brain regions, or than the 2D dopamine neuron that people typically uh, produce. Okay, so that's encouraging. And uh, we also demonstrated that through single cell RNA, uh, 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 this is through them technology at that time, that uh, we are able to have the presence of several type of uh, cells which present in the ventral midbrain. For example, in terms of uh, the inhibitor neurons marked by GABA. So the question is now, you can make this within a month, but what happens if you grow them in the long term, right? Three months later. So we saw this. So the, there are black spots coming out of this. You know, these are not contamination as well we initially thought about, uh, thought they are. Actually, they are very encouraging signs because these are the neuromelanins that I mentioned earlier in my talk. So these are the neuromelanin present specifically in the substantial region of the, uh, of the midbrain. So this is a very important finding because I told you that none of the mouse models produce it. In fact, the mice don't have neural matter, right? But yet surprisingly, and none of the earlier works produced uh, in vitro sort of spontaneous formation of neural matter. This is the first case that uh, a, a human in vitro neural cell uh, uh, aggregate is able, or a cell type is able to show this neural matter. Of course, we have to validate a bit more before claiming in this neural melanin, so we look at into the structures and look at the ANE stainings compared to our post-mortem human adult midbrain regions to see that really the black pigments as look similar to ours. And then we also look at the structures of this uh, neural granules isolated from organized and compared to the neural granules isolated from the, the post-mortem human brain tissue. And then again, they look very similar. Now this is the proof that I showed you. So the human ones are black, but not the mouse counterpart. So we take mouse ESLs, going, uh, make, make it undergoing the same protocol to make a mouse midbrain organoid, which contain TH neurons, okay? But they're not black, okay? So this lead me to uh, the, almost the end of the talk that, uh, uh, so currently what I'm really trying to do is to use sort of, kind of <laughs> innovative human neural stem cell technology to really understand human neural development and then and pathogenesis. And a, a major, major focus of my current team is actually neurodegeneration in Parkinson's disease, utilizing this human midbrain organoid. Of course, I mentioned development because I'm also very interested in, in pediatric uh, abnormal neurodevelopment diseases, much like the endocrine's case. Okay, then a little bit, uh, but to do, to, to, to essentially, this is what I'm trying to do, right? You have a dish of organoids, 
and we want to use this to model uh, a, a, a really uh, age-linked neurodegeneration de 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 disease such as Parkinson's, which has certain pathological hallmarks, right? One is a TH neuron degeneration, as you can see by the depigmentation in the subgenetic eye graph in the, in, 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 the, in, in the patient's brain, as well as abnormal protein aggregation in this particular case is known as we got. All right. So the question is, we are, we are very active in pursuing this direction to show that how can our midbrain organite be able to recapitulate those disease phenotype uh, in, the, in the dish? And if we can do that, then how can, you, how can we leverage this knowledge to understand or, or to small development of the uh, Parkinson's disease? All right. As I mentioned, uh, so I'm currently a junior PI, but uh, actually I will be moving and I will be joining Duke and U.S. Medical School as uh, beginning ne early next year as an assistant professor. So my brand new lab will be seeking uh, technician students and postdocs. And if you have any questions, my email is, is here. Okay. And the, uh, the last slide is really perhaps the most important part of this acknowledgement to those other institutes that I've worked with, um, National Neuroscience Institute of Singapore, the General Institute of Singapore, as well as Duke and U.S. Medical School. And of course, um, this is kind. Of, this talk is not possible if Azura didn't ask me. So, of course, we have to get credit. But this is this is fresh. Then I take this early this morning. Okay, so I, this is the machine that we are using right right in my lab, and we use it on a daily basis. Uh, uh, so the um, the the one advantage I really like about this machine is it has a very small of a size. So it's a very compact machine that then it can use for various purposes. Okay, I guess I will stop here and then if you guys have any and I take any questions you guys have. All right. Thank you, Dr. Alfred San, for your uh, very, very gorgeous uh scientific findings and you're able to thank turn you. it down to a very understandable layman term because the science paper is super complex. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Okay, uh, so we'll move into Q and A session. Anyone okay. has any question? Please type the uh, question in the chat box. Um, All right. So can... should, I, uh, should I stop sharing? Or... No, no, no. You you can you can just hang in there. Oh, okay. Yeah, I will just show this. All right. <laughs> All right. Any questions? So if you have any questions, please raise your hand. You can raise your hand. There's a raise hand button next to your name on the participants windows. If you can access it. So if you uh, can't raise your hand, please type your question in the chat box and we'll channel it to Dr. Alfred Sun. Okay, so uh, I'll start first. I have a quite I have a couple questions. So the first question is uh, from my understanding, uh, Dr. Alfred, you have a uh, near infrared uh, Western blot data in this paper. Am I right? Yes. So how would you present this data uh, in terms of publication? Okay, yeah. Um, so actually all the Western images I showed here are acquired, most, most of them I would say are acquired using the uh, NR system. Now, um, but it's shown, but, but it, it comes with, the original image comes with green and the red, uh, two channels, you can at least do that. But uh, to be consistent with some other Western blotting that our collaborator did, which is using the traditional chemilucent as method, which is black and white. So I actually just transformed those images into black and white and, and show in the, in the, in the, in the, in the paper. But this is really a, a matter of cosmetic and just to be consistent. If you like the, the, the color image better, but it, it, you know what I mean, just to be consistent with the red. So the one of the advantage I think about this system and I like it, and I mentioned is that this is more quantitative than the traditional Camelusens method. And another advantage is this that you can probe the same membrane at least two, two times without stripping and do the, uh, and be able to to do that, that's a, that's a huge bonus for me because many times I, as I mentioned, the increase in the protein level is very minimal and I have to be uh, very sure about it. This is an important piece of work, the uh, data. So we did it many, many times and, and uh, I think in this case, I wrote really, this NR system really helped to, to, to be sure about this 20% increase in the DP level. All right, so so this is why you choose the uh uh fluorescence Western blot over the chemiluminescence because of the quantitative features of it. That is right. That is right. Okay, so it will be uh, how many percentage of increment that you say that it must be quantitative in your research? 
Well, in this case, what we saw is in the end, we concluded it's about 20%. But again, depending on this is, this is just because of the work, the, the DK protein. In okay. other cases, it might be very different, right? But in, in, in our case, we are talking about 20%. So um, the fluorescence Western blot will give you up to 20% increment. That is precisely that increment, am I right? I, I, I think the fluorescence one can do even better, but the, what okay. we are dealing with is about 20%. Okay, okay. Thank you for your answer. Um, so if there's no one asking the question uh, from Q&A session, so I will just proceed with my own presentation. It's a sales speech, guys. Okay, so um, thank you, Dr. Alfred, for answering my questions. Um, no let problem. me share my screen. Okay. Can anyone see my screen now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Alfred Sam, for the awesome uh, presentation. So uh, we are Zoom Biosystems. This webinar is hosted by Zoom Biosystems. We aim to build products that bring real and substantial value to scientists. So to accomplish this vision, we simplify the way scientists work by innovating in unexpected places. Equipment-wise, we are currently having, uh, let me put on the pointer. Okay, so fire biomolecular imager, the first hybrid scanning system with ultimate scanning speed and flexible application. And we also have uh, a zoo imaging system, a better improved version of a zoo C series imaging system that Dr. Alfred used in his research. And the third one will be a zoo CLO real time PCR system, our newly launched reliable qPCR system. So, besides that, we have a variety of reagents and resin blotting accessories, such as total protein staining for your resin blotting needs. So, this is a zoo imaging system where Azul 600 is having the same specification as Azul C600 imaging system, which Dr. Alfred used to visualize protein knockout in a Western blot. Okay, each Azul imaging system provides flexibility, quantitative accuracy, intelligent workflow that gives you data integrity that meets publication standards. So these are the list of applications that can be performed with Azul imaging systems. It covers protein expression imaging, a protein DNA gel and also bioluminescence bacteria. You can choose your system based on your need. And here we have a total of six models for you to choose from and they all can be upgraded. If you're interested in Azul Imaging System or any of our products, please check out our app's website. Now comes with BIOS uh, product citation. BIOS is a pro search engine for life science uh, experimentation. So here you can check out uh, who and which research are you using this equipment. It's very good for uh, referencing. Okay, so thank you for your time here with us today. A huge thank you to Dr. Alfred Sun. Um, if you have any inquiries, any one of you have any inquiries, please feel free to contact us via the email shown on the screen, or you can contact your local distributor and we will follow up from there. All right. So thanks again for joining this live webinar. Thank you, Dr. Alfredson. Uh, I am Kyling. Okay, sorry, I am Kyling. So the regional field application scientist for Azuba system. Here today with us we have Nicole and also the Rikram. All right. Okay. So thank you everyone for joining. So before you go, please fill in the webinar feedback form to help us improve and shape our future webinar according to your need. So the link uh, will be pasted in the chat box, and or you can scan this QR code with your phone and give us your feedback. Thank you, everyone. Okay. All right. The chin up. Thank you, Dr. Alfred. I'm sorry for the checkout box. Yes, thank you, everyone, for coming. So if there's no more question for from the floor, I mean to Dr. Alfred San and us, uh, I will close this webinar room in the next five minutes. Okay, thank you.
Oh, yes. Uh, Dr. Alfred, uh, would you mind, do you want to put up your uh, final slide so anyone who interested, they, they can contact you? Uh, it, it's okay. That's oh. fine. fine, yeah. Okay, sure. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Dr. Alfred, again. So I'll show close the webinar room. Thanks, Dr. Alfred. Thanks, Colin. Thank you. See you again. Bye. See you again. Everyone uh, stay safe. Bye-bye.